I don't even know how long. 47 it. minutes, I believe. Yeah. And it's breathing in yeah. and out yeah. kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. And it's, um, and I, um, am I on here? Yes. Yeah. Um, it's called circular breathing okay. is the term. Circular breathing. And uh, it's uh, what you do is you breathe in as you're blowing out. And uh, it takes a while to learn, but the, the, the simplest concept, and you can try this at home, is when you brush your teeth, right? You brush your teeth, and then you take a, a glass of water, and you rinse your, your, the inside of your mouth, and you, you all spit the water out. But when you go home today, try this, and you'll see you can do it. As you're spitting the water out in a steady, in a steady stream, breathe in with your nostrils. And uh, that's circular breathing. And so that's the concept. And so Kenny, he could hold it out for, you know, uh, 100 minutes if he wanted to or longer. As long as he could breathe, he can hold out a note. But yeah, he, uh, it's something like 47 minutes he's held a note out for. He holds a Guinness Book of World Records. And Taylor Hicks, you know, Taylor Hicks from American Idol, harmonica player. Taylor, he's known for his circular breathing. He can hold the harmonic note out real long time. But anyway, yeah. Yeah, pretty cool. Pretty it cool. Is pretty cool. Um, we've been working through Exodus uh, here at Grace. And let me read these verses. Then he said to Moses, that being God, come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and worship from afar. Moses alone shall come near to the Lord, but the others shall not come near, and the people shall not come up with him. And so at this point, just thinking about the whole idea of worship, you're leading in worship on a regular basis. How does Dennis Wisdala stay fresh with your walk with the Lord so that you don't get up here and you feel like a hypocrite? You want to you wanna do it in a way that honors the Lord. Well, first of all, you need to, as a minister, whether you're a, a pastor, whether you're an evangelist, whether you're a musician, uh, a Sunday school teacher, anything to do with ministry, whether you're working in a nursery, whatever, it's very easy. There are some people out there who believe that you are, in, in order to minister, you need to be a super Christian. You need to have a, an S emblazoned on your chest. And, and if you're not better than they are, then you probably ought not to even be in ministry. And if that's the case, there wouldn't, there wouldn't be anybody in ministry I, because we're all sinners. And we all blow it every day. You know? and, and so what I do to stay fresh is I recognize that the fact that God used Moses, who was a murderer. He used David, who was an adulterer. He used all these different heroes of the faith uh, that made the... the, the Hall of Faith in Hebrews, and they've all blown it in their lives. And so I stay fresh by, number one, uh, confessing my sins to God every day in my devotions and prayer, uh, reading my Bible, staying in devotions, and, uh, and, and realizing that God has given me what he has given me for a purpose, and that's to share the gospel and be an encouragement to Christians. And if I realize that, number one, I'm not any better than the, everybody else. That, make, that makes me realize that I can do this. I can do this. I don't have to be some ultra super Christian, although I strive to be. Don't get me wrong. I strive to be as holy as I can be. But I realize the fact that God uses everybody. And then I... I stay with. I, I have a close walk with God through daily devotion and prayer and, and fellowship with, with Him. Um, you said that after you got saved, we were talking to this morning, and you said there was a guy that came up to you. You just got saved, and this guy, well, interesting fellow, he had some advice for you or some thoughts, and what you did with that. When I first got saved at the age of 30, um, I was a baby Christian. And all I knew is I wanted to play those horns for God for the rest of my life. And I met this pastor on the street in downtown Bay City. True story. And he was a very legalistic, very ultra-conservative pastor. And I told him, I'm Dennis Quizell, I'm a saxophone player, and I want to play for the Lord. And he looked at me and said, well, you do know that you're going to have to put those horns away. 
He said, you can never use those saxophones for God. I said, really? He said, yeah, because it'll remind people of honky-tonks and nightclubs and bars, and it'll be a bad testimony. God pretty much just uses, like, piano and organ. And I believed him because I was just a baby Christian. I didn't know the Bible. I didn't know where Exodus was located in the Bible. I didn't, was that New Testament? Was it Old Testament? And so I believed him. And I put those horns away. And I could take it to the very basement that those horns collected dust. And for about four years, I was the most unhappiest Christian you ever met. I started attending a Baptist church. It wasn't this guy's church. It was another church. And it was a Baptist church in Bay City, and I, I would sit at the very last pew in the church, and at the closing prayer, I'd sing the congregation of songs, I'd give my tithes, and at the closing prayer, when the pastor would close in prayer, I would sneak out. And I did that every Sunday. Every Sunday morning, Closing prayer, I'd sneak out. I was the most unhappiest Christian there was. And that went on for about three or four years. And one Sunday, like every other Sunday, as a pastor was closing the service in prayer and ready to dismiss the people, I did what I, ever, I did every Sunday. I snuck out of the church. And when I got to the front door of the church, I felt a hand on my shoulder. I turned around, and it was the pastor's wife. And she said, Dennis, we heard that you play the saxophones. I said, well, I used to, but not anymore. And the pastor's wife said to me, well, we've got a problem then. I said, what's the problem? She said, you're, you're scheduled for special music next Sunday morning. <laughs> Praise the Lord for pastor's wives. I said, what? you want me to play my saxophone? She said, yeah, of course. I said, I've never played in church before. And so she introduced me to Jim Clough, was his name, the church organist. And she said, do a duet with Jim next week. You and Jim will play, he'll play the organ, you play the saxophone. And to tell you the type of style that Jim Clough played on the organ, he used to play for a National Hockey League team, okay? <laughs> so every time we played to him, we wanted to check people into yeah. the wall, you know? <laughs> yeah. So he had that style. And so I introduced myself. I said, Brother Jim, I'm Brother Dennis Grizel. I'm a saxophone player, and I'm scheduled for special music next week. He said, well, what are you going to play? I said, I don't know. What do you suggest? I've never played in church before. He said, well, he took out an old gospel music songbook, and he rattled through the pages, and he said, well, here's a song by Stuart Hamblin called It Is No Secret What God Can Do. Why don't we play this song next week? How many have ever heard that song, It Is No Secret? Um, beautiful song. And so I said, okay, we will. How does it go? I've never heard it before. And so we played that on the organ, and I played along with the alto sax. That next Sunday, they were pitching babies over the balcony. We had a great time in church. The Sunday after that, Jim and I played Mansion Over the Hilltop by Iris Stanton. And the week after that, Jim and I played uh, Victory in Jesus. Soon after that, I became the music pastor there at that church. I was interim music director for 13 years. <laughs> interim. And then God called me to do what I'm doing like I did today. And I'll end it with this. I never realized how prophetic that first song was that I ever played in church. It is no secret what God can do. I'm living a dream. I get to be with, with great churches like yours every Sunday. I, can't, I travel all over the country. I see hundreds and hundreds of souls saved every year and thousands of saints encouraged. And, and, and I realize that every one of us here, this is how I want to end this story. Every one of you here has a, at least one talent that God has given you. It may not be music. It might be. But maybe you're a people person, and you've been told you give firm handshakes, and you like to look people in the eye, and you're, you're friendly. You could be the best visit, uh, the 
greeter at this church. Churches are always looking for greeters. You may be a, a lady, a, a grandma that loves to cuddle babies and hold babies, and, 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 you, and it's easy for you to calm them down. The nursery is one of the most important ministries of any church. Young, people, young families want to know who's watching their babies while they're worshiping the Lord in the sanctuary. But what I, I want to say is this, and then I'll turn it back over to you, Mark. Don't let anybody tell you that whatever talent you feel is God-given cannot be used for God. That that's not true. God can use anyone for anything. Why? Because he's God. Now, I don't want to, I actually, Sunday school teachers, be patient for a moment here. I know you may be thinking about the clock and getting to your class, but I think we're hitting something very, very important. Um, God's called you to also not just be a musician, but an evangelist. And there may be somebody here that's done church a really long time, but they don't have a relationship with Christ. They know how to do church. and uh, But there also might be somebody that came today, and they they don't do church. They just came because they're like, man, I like music and, and things along that line. How can somebody know that they know that Jesus is the Lord of their life and they're on their way to heaven, their sins are forgiven? How can they know that, Dennis? You know, Mark, it's amazing. I've been in churches where when I would give the altar call, the invitation, I had deacons come up. I've had a church organist come up. I've had people that have been in church all their lives. And you may be here today and you knew the right words to say if someone were to ask you the question. <laughs> you may have known what the right answer was. But in your heart of hearts, you would admit that you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. If that's you this morning, it's not a coincidence you're here. God knew you were going to be here today. He wants you to sell it once and for all. I was in Alabama after a church service, and a, a lady about 68 years old came up to my table and was crying. I said, ma'am, what's wrong? She said, my husband received the Lord Jesus Christ today as a Savior. And he, I could never get him to church. As a youngster, he had a bad experience. Something happened in church, and he just quit going to church. But he came today just to hear a saxophone played. And he, he heard the gospel, and he received Jesus Christ as a Savior that day. And the gospel is very simple. We, we tend to complicate it. We tend to make it more complicated than what it is. There, it's simply four, four simple points. Number one, we're all sinners here. Every one of us here today has blown it. Every one of us has blown it. At least once. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're all sinners. We all must admit that. Number two, there's a price we have to pay for sin. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. And not just physical death. I'm looking around the sanctuary this morning. With all due respect, no matter how young you may be, no matter how old you may be here, if Jesus Christ doesn't come back for another 100 years, I think he is, but if he doesn't, if he doesn't come back for another hundred years, none of us here are getting out of here alive. You realize that? One hundred years from now, every one of us here today will be physically dead. But not just physically separated from God, but spiritually separated from God, because heaven is a holy place. Heaven is a sinless place. So therein lies a problem. We all want to get to heaven one day. But we can't get there on our own because we're sinners. So therein lies the problem. But the good news is this. The good news is, the Bible says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's a gift. You know, for I've got four grandchildren. Three of them are boys, grandsons. And for their one-year birthday, for their first birthday, I go to the Louisville Slugger baseball bat company. And when I was growing up, uh, my idol was Al Kaline. Now, I know that's a dirty name because 
Howard Tigers beat the 68 St. Louis Cardinals in seven games. Okay, but Bob Gibson, who rock. I mean, we could, that was my favorite World Series of all time, mm -hmm. seven games, right? But you would have your autographed Bob Gibson bat or Al Kaline bat or Lou Brock bat, right? Well, I would have their names autographed. Madden Guizdela, Jackson Guizdela, Lennon Gene Batch. And for their first birthday, I would take this autographed Louisville Slugger bat and for their first birthday party, I'd say, hey, Madden or Jack or Lennon, come, come here, Papa's got something for you. Happy birthday, happy birthday. And they, as a one-year-old, they'd waddle over, you know, and they'd come and they'd take the bat and they'd swing it and knock the lamps over, you know, and all that. <laughs> the ladies all had a fit. But anyway, but I would give them that bat. And there's a great analogy in that. That bat did not cost them a dime. It cost me quite a bit of money to get their name autographed. But to them, it was free. And that's like with salvation. Salvation is a gift. Jesus Christ, it cost him something. It cost him his life and his life. To us, it's free. But there was a price. And finally, there's, a, there's something we do. There is a catch. We have to receive Jesus Christ. We have to receive him personally individually into our hearts. Much like Madden or Jack or Lennon had to take that bat. And once they took that bat, that bat became theirs. That bat became theirs. And on August 4th of 1986, I realized the truth that I'm a sinner. I need Jesus Christ in my life. I need to receive him as my personal Lord and Savior to allow that salvation to be appropriated to me so that I can be saved. And so on August 4th of 1986, I received Jesus Christ as my Savior. And so if you're here today and you've never received Jesus Christ, you can. It's that simple. Salvation is free, but we have to receive him. Well, right now what's going to happen is we're going to take a love offering for Dennis. So I'm going to ask the ushers to make their way back. And if you don't mind getting ready to 